Amen. Please be seated. Teens can go to class, so teenagers, you are dismissed. <clears throat> Have a great class. All right. How many of you are grateful for God's amazing grace in your life? Amen. <clears throat> If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians today, chapter 5. Ephesians 5, it's good to see so many here. I know we have folks, time of year and season and uh, vacation, and I know VBS, big week this week, so I want to encourage you, as Brother Philip and James already mentioned, be praying. If you're not doing anything, uh, stop by one night, be praying for us, um, and uh, we're excited about that. <clears throat> and uh, again, just want to encourage you, be faithful be in church when you're here, when you're in town this summer, and uh, we've got some exciting things we'll be sharing with you even next week. Um, if you're visiting, thank you for being here today. We're really honored, always counted a great privilege to have people visiting with us. Please stop at the Welcome Center on your way out, and uh, we would love to get to meet you. Also want to encourage our folks, be faithful in your tithes and offerings today, and you can give online. Or here. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Today, we've been in the middle of a, a, just a small study that we've been entitled the, the Gifts of God. How many of you like to receive gifts? All right. <clears throat> and uh, can I just say this? God has given us a lot of gifts. He has given us things far more than we deserve, that's for sure. So we don't have time to go through all these gifts, but the last couple of weeks and then today uh, we're going to end, but we're going to speak about three great gifts that God has given to us. He, he gives us that first and greatest gift, that gift of salvation, which means he redeems us, he saves us, he forgives us, he cleanses us, he pardons us from our sin. It is a free gift made available through Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, we get to enter into God's grace, and God's grace produces all of those things in us. And so the Bible says that when we understand we're sinners and we can't get to God, there's nothing in our ability that would earn a, a merit with God, but we understand Jesus came to us and we accept this gift by faith that we then are not only saved, we're, we're given a new relationship with God. We're given a new home in heaven forever. And we're given a new purpose, a new lease on life. And then God says, and because it was my gift to you, that gift is secure. You can't lose that gift. That gift is secured because of me. And you are in my hand. What an amazing gift from God. And so last week, we, we really introduced this gift that we're going to speak about today, but God says, I am going to give you another gift that, quite frankly, <clears throat> is from me, and that will change your life forever. You will never be alone. I will give you the greatest friend you will ever have, and that gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. If I were to ask you today, <clears throat> how many of you think friends are important in your life, most of us would say yes. All of us have been hurt by friends. All of us have been blessed by friends. They say the average person has three to five very close friends, 10 to 15 in an inner circle, and maybe in their life they know 100, 150 people in their network. What's interesting, I was reading this week, they, I don't know how they estimate this, but they estimate that an average friendship between two people lasts 17 years. So think about that. Now maybe you have a friend that, goes way beyond that and praise God for that friend. A good friend is hard to find, but maybe you would say, I had some friends that, you know, it didn't last very long at all, a couple weeks, then they stabbed me in the back, you know, it wasn't no 17 years, and I get that. It's hard to find good friends. Quite frankly, I think we all understand, you and I get connected with the wrong type of friends. It has a, a, a really a devastating influence in our life. But you, you get surrounded with people who, who are good friends in your life. They can encourage you and support you, and we praise God for that. But here's what God does. God says, look, I'm going to give you a friend that will be unlike any other friend. I'm going to give you a friend that will stay with you forever. As a matter of fact, we were introduced to him last week in Ephesians chapter 1. We were told last week that in verse number 13, we were told that Jesus in whom you trusted after that, you heard the word of truth, you know, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 
So last week, Paul was writing to these new Christians because they were struggling, wait a minute, okay, we received this gift of salvation, we, we trusted in, in Christ, but I mean, is this a gift that lasts forever? Is, am I gonna lose this? What's gonna happen? And, and he would say, no, absolutely not, because this gift was from me. And because it's from me, I sealed you. Remember, we talked about this last week, uh, the water bottle, you, you crack that seal open. A seal is a mark. It's a preservation. And God said, I have marked you. I have sealed you. You are now my child. You're in my family. And the individual that has the job of sealing or preserving us is this Holy Spirit of promise. We were told in verse 14, he is that earnest or that down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. God said, look, I am sending the Holy Spirit. You believed and took my gift and then I'm securing your gift by the Holy Spirit and I am leaving the Holy Spirit with you. He is a down payment. He's my assurance, God says, that I'm coming back to take you one day to be with me. That should be an encouragement to us as we look around. Aren't you glad if you know Christ? This is not it. There is something better yet to come. And when you start to doubt that, you remember, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit inside me reminds me of that. God left him there as a down payment to remind me he's coming to get me. It's also there to assure me that I'm going to experience this great inheritance that God has for me in heaven one day. The Holy Spirit of God. He is the spirit that ensures that I belong to God, that God is coming back for me, and to ensure me that I am never alone, that he is always with me. Paul said he is that spirit that had been promised to the followers of Jesus. You say, when did that happen? John 14 and verses 16 and 17. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he said, look, we're friends. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, gotta, I gotta help you understand this. I'm leaving. We've all had people in our lives leave us. My dad used to have a sign in his office. He was a college professor for 45 years. And the sign would say, everyone brings joy to this office. Some by entering, some by leaving. <laughs> We've all had people leave us. Some we were like, whew, that was great. But some, we were heartbroken. Maybe they left because of extenuating circumstances. Maybe nothing bad. It, just, it was just part of it. Maybe because of death. And Jesus says to his friends, look, I'm leaving but I want you to understand that these things I've taught you and my relationship with you doesn't end. I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you, how long? Forever. Who is he? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knows him, but you know him. Now notice, for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. So the spirit of God is a gift from God and he comes to dwell with us. If I went to your home today and I knocked on your door and you said, hey, uh, please come on in and I just stuck my foot in your door. I'm not in. I might be partially in, but I'm not dwelling with you, I'm not all the way involved in this conversation we're having, I have just stuck a foot in the door. But if I enter whole body all the way in, now, now we can commune, now we can have a relationship, I can dwell with you for an hour or so, we can communicate and talk. So the words are very important, and God said, look, I give you a gift and he dwells in you. It's not something you could go get. I gave him to you. He dwells with you, and he shall be in you. And he is the fulfillment of a promise that Jesus made to us. So you're thinking about, wow, gifts from God? 
God saves my soul and he keeps that secure and then he gives me someone who will be the best friend I could ever have. He gives me God the Spirit who will never leave me. Can't see him, but he's there. Who, so who is this Spirit? And, and that's important for us to understand. Well, we know as you study the Bible that this Spirit is God. He's not a God He's not kind of like God. He is God, the Holy Spirit. Now, no doubt you've heard about the, tr- the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And a lot of not only false religions, but I mean even churches and denominations get really confused and misconstrue the doctrine of the Trinity. The, the reality that there are three eternal distinctions in one divine essence. I've said this before. You know, my kids, I'm dad to my wife, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honey, and to, to, to you all, I'm pastor, but I'm one guy. You take water, and the chemical compound of water is H2O. So whether you have it in liquid form, whether you have it in, 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 in frozen form, whether you have it in steam, the elements are the same. They're unchanged. That's a, a great picture of this idea of the trinity we know that there is a big bright sun in our galaxy in our atmosphere how do we know that has anybody ever gone face to face with the sun has anybody ever touched the surface of the sun no but we know there's a sun through the sunlight the beams and the rays that come and travel all those light years in that distance to get here to planet Earth reveal that there is a sun. And then we see the power of that sun as it helps things to grow. And what a great picture of God. There is one God. Have I ever touched God? Have I ever been face to face with the Father? I haven't, but I know he exists because of the sun. The sun came here and revealed the Father, and I see the power of the Father through the Holy Spirit's working in man's life. 1 John 5, verses 6 and 7 Here's how John described it. This is he that came by water and by blood, even Jesus Christ. The water signified his baptism when his ministry started and the blood his death when he died on a cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, that's Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. By the way, depending on what version of the Bible you read, that verse is omitted. We know in a lot of cults and in false religions that verse is omitted, but sad to say in some English translations they decided just to take it out. Seems like an important doctrinal verse to me. So he is God. And his gift, God's gift to me is really himself. And that he's going to be with me and he's going to indwell me forever. What a gift. What else do we know about the Spirit of God? He's involved when I become saved. When you take that greatest gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God, I need a savior. God, I'm in big trouble. I can't go to heaven. I can't be like you, but I realize you came. You died for me. We're buried and rose again. I want your gift of salvation. When you receive that gift, the Holy Spirit's involved. What does he do? The Bible says he quickens us in Ephesians 2. That means he makes us alive. Remember we've said this before, that only in Jesus are you truly alive. You ex- there are a lot of people exist, but life comes through Jesus. Remember 1 John 5, 12, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the Holy Spirit quickens us. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. We are dead to God until we receive his life-changing, life-saving gift of salvation. And the Spirit makes us alive. The Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. You say, what are you talking about? The word baptism in the Bible means to be put into. So you're put into the water. The Spirit takes us at that moment of salvation and puts us into the body of Christ, 
into the family of God. That's one of his jobs. You become a son. You become a daughter. What else does he do? At that moment of salvation, he indwells us. You say, what do you mean by that? He comes and lives in us. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, but you are not of the flesh, but you are in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. So uh, how do I know that I'm 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 a believer? The spirit lives in me. If the spirit doesn't live in me, then that's another indication I'm not a child of God. If any man is not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So he comes and he indwells. And again, please, please understand this. And some of you know, and you've been to churches, there are churches today that teach the false teaching that you and I have to go and find the spirit of God. We have to go and get him and find him today and maybe he left and we gotta go get him again and you know, maybe this week I'll have more of him than I did last week. And all of that is false because God said he is my gift to you and he is given to you at that moment of salvation. It is he that secures you. It is he that marks you as a child of God. I put this person in God's family and, and I'm indwelling this person. This person is sealed. He is made alive in Christ Jesus. That is God's gift to you and to me. And I cannot go and find him. He's God's gift. So I just need to understand what God has given to me and respond accordingly. He's involved in my salvation, but then he is involved in my daily life of sanctification. You say, what is that? It's a big word, which means to become more like Jesus Christ. How many of you think that you got a lot of work still until you can become more like Jesus Christ? Okay, all right. Now, are we trying to be more like Jesus Christ so that we can get into heaven? Never gonna happen. That's why Jesus came to save us. But until he takes us home, he leaves us here because there's a plan, there's a purpose. And in that purpose, he wants us to look more like him and talk more like him and act more like him so that we can represent him to people who don't know him. And so as I go through daily life, it's the spirit that he gave to me that is there to help me to become more like Jesus Christ. Because who knows more about God than God? And that's what he does. What does he do? He is the fulfillment of the promise. He reproves the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In John 16, he's there to tell me, hey, that's wrong. Hey, that's right, Dan. Hey, this is what happens if you don't do what you should do. He's there to teach us. He's there to bring the word of God to our remembrance. He's there to comfort us. We need comfort at times. He's there to encourage us and to help us. And he's there to pray for us. I appreciate when people say, hey, I am praying for you. By the way, this is for all of us. We shouldn't say that if we're not actually doing it. But doesn't it mean something when you know somebody's praying for you? Well, think about this. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, Paul would say this, that the Spirit helps our infirmities. I need help. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought. You ever prayed the wrong thing or prayed for the wrong thing? And later you realize, why was I praying that way? But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings and utterings we cannot be uttered. I mean, he's got a conversation, as it were, with the Father. I I couldn't understand it if if I wanted to. He goes to God on my behalf. Jesus has gone to the Father on my behalf. It's a great picture. It's a great example for us to follow. He prays for us. The Holy Spirit of God, what an amazing gift. What a friend that God gives to us. And he's more than just a feeling. He's more than just an experience. So if this is really a a, a reality and a truth and a gift from God, then what is my responsibility when it comes to this Holy Spirit who lives inside of me? Well, the first thing that I have to understand is that God has given the Spirit to us as a gift at the time of my salvation. Remember, he was the earnest 
When I got saved, he was the deposit, the down payment at that moment. He doesn't come later. And again, I don't go find him. I have been given him by God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Here you go. Paul was trying to explain it. And he said, look, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, notice, which is in you, which you have of God? You didn't go get him, you didn't go find him, you didn't conjure him and persuade him and manipulate until he exposed himself. God gave him to you, and you are not your own. So therefore, what does he say? Understand you've been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord's. Listen, Understand what you have is from God. And so quit living to yourself. Quit going out and doing what you think is best. When you have God, the Holy Spirit inside you, let him lead. Let him guide. Let him influence your life so that you bring honor and glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Understand, again, to the same group Paul would write. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. He doesn't momentarily dwell. He's not a snowbird six months here and six months away. He dwells in you forever. So here's the responsibility. If a man defiles this temple of God, you you just say, well, I don't care that the Spirit lives inside of me and I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. Him shall God destroy, ruin, and destruction And consequences are certainly going to come because your body is the spirit of God's temple. So don't reject him, but listen to him. Follow him. We can grieve the spirit of God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.30 that we should not grieve the spirit of God. You grieve, a person grieves over someone they love. I mean, you, you know, you might be empathetic and, you know, oh, hey, I'm, I'm a little sad. If, but for somebody you didn't really know, but you grieve over somebody that you love. The Spirit loves us. And we can grieve him by disobeying him. The Bible says, quench not the Spirit of God. That means you can extinguish him. Like, Quit talking to me. I don't want to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to you. And no, 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 no. And the Bible said that's a mistake because he's God's gift. Well, then how am I supposed to respond? Let's look in Ephesians chapter 5. And so, again, Paul is writing to these new Christians. And he's trying to teach them about their new life because they are a Christian. And he said, hey, look, see then that you walk circumspectly. Always be looking around. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Would you agree that the days are evil? Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. How many of you have ever said, boy, I really, there's been times in my life, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. I just didn't know what the next step was. Okay? Paul says, look, If you want to be able to make the right decisions and to survive in an evil world and not waste your time, here's what has to happen, verse 18. Here's a comparison. Don't be drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What is my response to this gift that God has given to me? Be filled with the Spirit. The word filled means to be uh, leveled up to be completely consumed, to, in, in essence, to, to have crammed into your life to the fullest extent. It means this, that let the Holy Spirit completely fill your life in every aspect, in every area, in every nook, in every cranny, in every word, in every thought, in every action. Let him be in control. How many of you like to eat? You know, some people live to eat, some people eat to live, right? <clears throat> How many of you have ever been to an all-you-can-eat buffet? Amen. Amen? How many of you get your money's worth at the all-you-can-eat buffet? 
You know, what's interesting, they say in, in the last 10 years that all you eat, uh, can eat buffets have decreased by 26%. They're closing down. And those that remain open, there's been a real shift in these all-you-can-eat buffets that now they're putting stipulations. It's all you can eat for one price for two hours. You say, what's the problem? They're losing money. I read about a woman who was booted recently from a golden corral because she ate all the brownies that were out at the dessert table (laughs) and waited for the next tray to come out where she scooped them up and put them all in her purse. So she was escorted out. They said this was some kind of record, but I read there was a German triathlete who was asked to prematurely leave an 1895 buffet after he consumed 100 plates of sushi. These buffets are losing money because people walk in all consumed to get as much as they can in any way possible, even to the, 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 the height of gluttony and stuffing it in your pockets and putting it in your purse, they're going to get all they can possibly get. They want to be filled, okay? That's what Paul's saying here as a Christian. God gave you the Holy Spirit of God. Let him just fill every aspect of your life. Don't tell him no. Don't reject him. Let him have control of your life every single day. And if you do that, you will bring honor and glory to God. Let him be in control of your life. The Bible says this in Galatians 5 and verse 25. Very succinctly, Paul would write, if we live in the spirit, then let us also walk in the spirit. So if the spirit of God, it it, it gave me life, the spirit of God is in me, then every day, every moment of every day, let him lead you. Just walk with him arm in arm, hand in hand. Let him control your life before you get up every morning and put your two feet on the ground. God, you're in control today. And let him lead you. Nothing will change your life as a Christian more in your sanctification than if you and I understand the working of the Spirit of God and we learn to follow his leading in our life. Be led by the Spirit of God. He is God's gift. You say, why is that so important? Let me just give you a couple quick thoughts. First of all, there's a purpose for the Spirit of God. The reason God gives us this amazing gift of himself is to help us in this journey of life. Notice in verse 15 of Ephesians 5. See then, Paul said, that you walk or you live your life, you go through life circumspectly. That's 360. Not as fools, but as wise. Have you ever had something happen to you, and wow, it caught you off guard, and you said, I didn't see that coming. Wow, I should have paid more attention. Wow, I should have seen what was happening. And you look like a fool, or you responded like a fool, or you didn't respond, and therefore were foolish. The Holy Spirit has a purpose in your life and mine as a Christian, One of his purposes is to help us to be wise in our ways. As you go through life, as you go to work, as you raise your kids, as you you, you, you dwell with your spouse, as you have friendships, in every aspect of life, his job is to help you and to help me navigate it in a way in which we honor God. Paul said, watch your step. But here's the thing. If you and I don't listen to the Spirit, there's no way. We don't know everything. Contrary to belief. And and we're going to make huge mistakes. But if we'll listen to the Spirit of God, he'll help us to do what is right. He wants us in every aspect of life to be wise. Not only to help us be wise in, in our ways, but to help us to be wise with our days. Verse 16. Redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Poneris from which we get the English word pornography. Paul said, these days are wickedly evil. 
And are you going to waste these days? Are you going to chase things that don't matter? Are you going to invest? Are you going to plummet? Are you going to do deep dives into things that are going to destroy your lives? Are you going to make every moment count? And the only way that we make every moment count is if we depend upon the Holy Spirit of God. And he said, if you want to redeem the time, you want to buy it back, all of us can look at our lives and say, wow, I've made some huge mistakes and I have some big regrets and I've wasted a lot of time and there's honestly nothing we can do about it. But where we go from here, I mean, uh, July 23, 2023, I mean, are we gonna keep living that way or is today and tomorrow and every day thereafter, I'm just gonna be dependent on the spirit of God. God, I don't wanna waste a moment. I don't wanna waste an hour. I don't wanna waste a week. I don't wanna waste another year. I want to make sure that everything that is done honors you and it's what needs to be done and, 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 and that I, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being wise and not foolish. Don't we always say, you know, it seems like the older you get, the, the, the more quickly time passes. Sometimes hours are long, but years go quickly. And look, some of us have already wasted too much time. And God said, but you don't have to. I gave you this gift of the Spirit to help you to use your time wisely, to help you to, to do the right things. And then the Spirit's purpose is to help us to be wise with the truth. We talk a lot about the truth. Truth is singular. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is truth. We need stability Media is not going to give you stability, your friends and your neighbors and, and coworkers, even your own emotions. You, you and I need truth. It is the truth that makes us free. So what does the Spirit do? His job is to keep us in line with the truth. Like, no, 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 no don't, don't go that way. Don't, don't start buying into that stuff. You know better. This is what God says. He helps us with the truth. Failure to do what the Spirit says is utter foolishness. He says in verse 17, don't be unwise or don't be just senseless, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I don't want to misstep. I don't know. Should I choose this career path? Should I be in a relationship with this person? What should I do about this habit? Is, is this right? Is this, I, I, what is, I need to know. You need to know the truth. And who helps you know the truth? The Spirit of God. He's the greatest teacher that you'll ever, ever listen to if you listen to him. What must the angels think when they look from heaven and they see, wow, they have the spirit of God inside of them and they won't listen to him. No wonder we make so many horrible mistakes. We talk to famous people, scholarly people, people with degrees behind their name to try to get advice and try to get counsel and try to get wisdom. And, and, and that's great in its, in its time and in its place. But we do all of that often to the neglect of talking to God and seeking God and knowing the truth from God. Google tells us that 63,000 search queries are made every second in the United States. That translates to 5.6 billion Google searches every day in our country, or 2 trillion global searches per year. How many of us have already been on our phone today looking up something? But wouldn't it be great if we could say, hey, I know today I have this many times talked to God about this. I know already today I, I listened and I was in tune with the Holy Spirit of God about what I should do and what I shouldn't do. The Spirit of God guides us into truth. John 16 and verse 13, here's what the Spirit does. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Here's the thing, the Holy Spirit will never mislead you. Your feelings will mislead you, your heart will mislead you, your emotions will mislead you, people will mislead you, culture will mislead you, but the Holy Spirit of God will never mislead you because nobody loves you more than he. He will always lead you into truth. We don't always like that, but at least you know what you're getting. And he won't speak of himself. He's not, well, here's my opinion, here's my advice. Or I think in this situation, he will always tell you the truth of God and of God's word. Whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak it, and he'll show you things to come. 
Proverbs, uh, John 14, 26, but that comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he'll bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Have you ever, like, been in a conversation, or maybe you're in an experience in your life, and all of a sudden, I mean, just uh, out of the blue, uh, you, you remembered something that you heard in a service, or maybe you heard a TV preacher say something, or you remembered a Bible verse that you had read, and it just, like, popped into your brain, and you were like, Wow! And you thought, how'd that happen? What a coincidence. That's the Spirit of God. That's his job. So if I'll listen and let him lead and just take every part of me, then he will help me to make good and wise decisions and to use my time in a right way and to follow truth and not be deceived. How many of us have been deceived? How many of us as average Christians don't even know the books of the Bible? I mean, we know stats for ball games. We know Dow Jones reports. We know what's on Netflix, how many episodes. But we don't even know the books of the Bible. So there's a purpose for the Spirit. That's why I got to let him lead. But there's not only a purpose, but the Holy Spirit of God gives me power. I went to my garage the other day to get a drill. I needed to drill something in, so I had the attachments ready to go. There's the battery. Pulled it off the charger, popped it in, and I went, and there was nothing. Nice drill, nice attachments, had everything I needed, just no power. If there's no power, it doesn't matter what, what instruments and tools you have, doesn't matter what they look like, don't matter how expensive they were, it's not going to work. You understand one of uh, the reasons why we must let the Spirit of God lead in our lives is He's the one that generates supernatural power for us. He is our power source. And when we don't listen to Him and we do our own thing and we don't understand this gift God has given to us, we go through life powerless. And that's when we keep falling back into that temptation. And I know I said never do it again, and, and I did it again, but I promise this time I'll never do it again. And the cycle continues. Why? Because you have no power. Why? Because in your own self and in my own self, I have no strength. Satan's not afraid of me. He can run all over me. But I have victory through Jesus Christ. And I can do all things through him. So he is my power source. The spirit is God and he lives in me. So I have all of God's power available in my life. So God can help me say no when I need to say no. And God can help me say yes when I should say yes. And God can help me to open my mouth and speak about him when I should. God can help me be honest when nobody else is. I can have his power if I let the spirit lead. The spirit, true Christianity is not marked by its outward characteristics, but by its inward obedience. Religions always try to regulate people from the outside rather than the inside out. The Holy Spirit changes us into what we need to be, into what Jesus wanted us to be. Now, I want you to see in verse 18, here's the comparison. Paul said, I hope you can get this. His power, you need it. He said, think about this. Be not drunk with wine, we're in a success. When you get drunk, there is no profitability to that. No benefit at all. It's a waste. Okay? So if you would rather be controlled by something instead of alcohol where you might get violent or angry or be a slobbering idiot and whatever and you wake up the next day and you're humiliated and you're embarrassed and have big regret... It it has no profitability, but if you would rather be controlled by something that will profit you in abundant ways, then let the Spirit of God control you. Because he will empower you to be what you need to be, to be the husband you need to be, the dad you need to be, the wife, the mom you need to be, to be the, the child you need to be, to be the man, the woman you need to be. He's the one that can give you the power to go to work when it's a bad environment. He's the one that can help you to think clearly. He's the one if you let him have control of your life. There is no such thing, however, as permanent intoxication. And anybody that's ever gotten drunk and wasted out of his mind is grateful for that. It's a process and you, you, whatever, and finally you realize, wow, and I'm never going to do that again. And sadly, the cycle many times 
continues. And by the way, let me just say a little side message. Nowhere in the Bible does God advocate drinking. Okay, I know water to wine. You, you study that. What you find is what God made was way better than anything else they ever presented. But there's no evidence that he made intoxication and, 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 and fermented wine. There's plenty of warnings against drinking. So ponder that. So here he says, instead of being consumed by things that don't matter, let the Spirit consume you. But as a person who gets drunk with alcohol, he won't stay drunk forever. A person who's controlled by the Spirit also will not happen permanently. There are responsibilities that the Spirit has that are permanent. When he gives you life, when he seals you, when he dwells with you, those are permanent. But your surrender to him is key for him to control your life. So daily, it's got to be a cooperative decision. It's got to be a deliberate choice that today, you helped me yesterday, I gave you control, but I understand I gotta do that again today. That's why Paul said, I die daily. You need to be in control today, God. I have to surrender to you, or if not, I'm going to surrender to something else, and it's gonna waste my time, and it's gonna end up with no profit and with huge regret. Only the Spirit can give you and give me power in my life to live the way that that God wants us to live. Zechariah 4, 6, we're told it's not by might, it's not by my power, it's not by my spirit or my efforts, but it's only by his spirit, saith the Lord. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why should I let the spirit lead in my life? Look, you let him lead because he's got a purpose. He, he, he keeps us on the right way. He, he, he helps us not to waste time. He keeps us in the truth. He gives us the power that we need to do what God wants us to do and then understand the product of the Spirit. He changes us. Hopefully, since you've come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a different person. Many of you know that passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit where the spirit inside you, if he's allowed to control and lead, he starts changing you. And now you start loving a little bit more and you have more joy than you had and you're a little more long-suffering and self-controlled and gentle and good and that's the spirit of God. He begins to change. Notice here what Paul would write, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in Ephesians 5, 19, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. If you let the Spirit lead in your life, things are going to start changing. One thing is the words that come out of your mouth. The, the song you have in your heart. Psalms and hymns. Spirit, where do spiritual songs come from? From the Holy Spirit. By the way, do you have a song in your heart? You say, I can't sing at all. It doesn't matter. I'm not talking about quality, I'm talking about do you have that song in your heart because of who Jesus is and what he's done in your life? And by the way, what songs come out of your mouth and running through your mind? What, what is the predominant music in life? Does that mean all secular music's wrong? No, but you should have spiritual songs in your life if the Spirit of God is in control of your life. Colossians 3 and verse 16, what are we told? Paul would say it this way, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's this idea, if the Spirit's leading, then the words coming out of my mouth are gonna start to be different. They're gonna be talking about God and I'm in conversations and music and words and next thing I'm humming something and I'm just saying, I'm different. Why? Because the Spirit of God's in charge. Not only that, you go back to Ephesians, and he says this in, in uh, verse 20, and then giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, you find you're thankful. Are you always thankful? That means in all, at all times. Well, I don't feel like being thankful. 
Well, what just happened to me? Uh, why should I be thankful? If you have the Spirit of God in your life and he's in charge, you find that no matter what's going on out here, you always have something for which to be thankful. And you can always be thankful at all times about all things. Because, hey, at least if I'm going through this, I'm not alone. The Spirit's with me, and I have the power to do what I need to do, and I can make the right decisions, and I don't have to be wasteful in my time. And, and so I'm thankful for that. God is with me, and God will comfort me, and the Spirit will guide me, and he's praying for me. You always have things for which to be thankful. And then notice verse 21, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Humility. We live in a very self-centered society. Me first. And that is a natural uh, response and a natural attitude. But when you come to Christ and the Spirit's in you and he starts coordinating and leading and guiding and directing and, and, and he's in charge, you understand that you start to humble yourself. And we don't have time, but if you read the rest of this chapter, that's where Paul gets in to all these little details. Hey, you're new Christians, he said, at Ephesus. And so you don't really know what this whole Christian life looks like and what it's supposed to be. So here's where it starts. You let the Spirit lead you, and here's how it's going to transform your life. In your marriage, all of a sudden, you're humble with one another. And all of a sudden, you can love your wife, husbands, like Christ loved the church. And all of a sudden, wives, you can stand and support your husband and pray for him and show him respect. And hey, kids, now you find that you can be obedient to your parents. And it goes on and on and on. You know how to interact with your boss and your employees. Instead of fighting everybody all the time and always thinking about yourself and always being full of pride. You'll be different if the Spirit of God is leading in your life. But it all starts with the Spirit of God. So here's what God says. I've given you this amazing gift of salvation. And I save you. And that salvation is secure in me. And you can't lose it. And you can't get rid of it. And you can't run away from it. Because it's in my hand. You belong to me, and I am giving you one more gift. I'm sending my spirit to seal you, to live in you, to never leave you, and never forsake you. And he is there to help you every day to be wise in your ways, wise with your time, to stay in the truth and to walk in a way that pleases God and to live life in this crazy world in a way that won't bring you regret. He's there to give you the power you need to do what you need to do to honor him. And he will begin to transform your life and you will become somebody you never thought possible. And he gets all the glory. But you and I have to say, take over. Lead me. I know you're there, but I surrender all. And you be in control of my life today. What an amazing <laughs> gift from God, the Holy Spirit. So I pray today, if you know Jesus and the Spirit's in you, know what you have. Listen to him. Follow him and let him do his work in your life. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God, you don't know what this salvation is, that's the greatest gift. See, the truth is you can't have the Spirit of God if you have not received God's salvation. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. He left heaven and came to us because we could not go to him. He died in your place and in mine, was buried and rose again to give you life forever, to give you a relationship with God brand new, to give you a home in heaven, to give you purpose in life. But you, as I have to say, Lord, I need you to be my Savior. I, I believe. And he'll cleanse you and forgive you give you access to his grace, which washes away your sin. And then that salvation is yours forever. Then you have the spirit of God, 
and you're never alone. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee, and I will never forsake thee. What a great promise. Hey, I hope you know the blessing of the Spirit of God in your life. If you've never made that decision to trust Jesus, I pray today that you will. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have an invitation. You say, what's an invitation? It's really an opportunity for you and for me to respond to God's leading in our lives. Nobody's going to come to you and embarrass you. Nobody's going to call you by your name. We would not at all do that. But we would love to pray for you today, talk with you if you'd like, open scripture, share God's truth today. Maybe you're here and you would say, you know, the the truth is, Pastor, if I died, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I want that relationship with God. I want to know that I know that I know for sure I'm going to heaven. I want that salvation in my life. And I understand now that Jesus died for me so that I might be saved from my sins. Pastor Dan, I'd like to make that decision to put my trust in Christ. With heads bowed, nobody looking around, I wonder, is there anybody here today and say, would you just pray for me, Pastor? I want to make that decision in my life. Please pray for me. Slip that hand up, put it right back down just so I can pray for you in my heart. God bless you. Thank you. Somebody else pray for me. Anybody else before I pray? Look, in a moment, I'm going to pray, and, and then we're going to have an invitation. We're going to stand, and heads will be bowed, and eyes will be closed, and people will be praying. Today, we'd love to talk with you. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you'd be willing, we invite you just to slip out in a moment. Come, I'll be right here at the front. Ryan, one of our ladies, will be here if you're a lady, and we'd love to pray with you, talk with you. Quite frankly, in the matter of just a couple of moments, today could be that day that you put your trust in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Today could be that day when you have that relationship and that assurance of your salvation. So we invite you to make that decision today. All you must do is repent. Lord, I know I can't be saved by myself. I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for me. And we pray you'll make that decision today. And Christian, those of us who've trusted Christ, let's listen to the Spirit of God. Let's follow his leading in our life. Let's be thankful for this amazing gift. Let him empower us. Let him lead us in our life so that God is glorified and honored. If you need to pray today or talk with someone, we invite you to do that. Let's stand for prayer. Can we do that? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I pray that you would help this invitation. Lord, work in hearts and lives. Help us in this quietness, in these couple moments to just talk to you. To make those decisions, Lord, you would have us to make, we pray. So, Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us as believers, Lord, to listen to God the Holy Spirit. Thank you for him. And I pray for those who raised a hand, Lord, who said they're not sure they'd go to heaven. They would like that gift of salvation. I pray that they'll make that decision to put their trust in you. They'll come here in just a moment and let somebody take a Bible and open that Bible and share the good news of, of, of how you came from heaven to earth to die for their sin. That in just a matter of a couple of moments, they could put their trust in you and change their life and their eternity. So, Lord, I pray, have your will and way. We ask in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed. Would you just take a moment today as Adam plays? If you need to come, you come. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Need to come and pray, come and talk with someone today. We invite you to do that. You won't be missing anything. You'll be gaining so much. If you don't know the Lord, today is your Savior. I pray you'll come.